Faith Milton, Creative Director of NRDC's Rewrite the Future. Welcome to The Last Laugh, Comedy in the Age of Climate Change with Quinta Brunson and Mike Scharr, part of the 2024 Sundance Film Festival. NRDC is an environmental advocacy organization leading the fight against the climate crisis. Since 1970, our lawyers, scientists, and environmental experts have been working to protect the world's natural resources and public health, with the support of more than 3 million members and activists. Our Rewrite the Future program leverages NRDC's environmental expertise to help Hollywood creators tell entertaining stories about our climate-altered world and the path toward a better future. Let's face it. Climate change is scary, and a lot of us would rather not think about it. But sometimes, the things that make us uncomfortable can be a great place to look for comedy. And that's what we'll explore today with two of television's great comedy creators, Quinta Brunson and Mike Schur. Quinta stars in and serves as creator, showrunner, head writer, and executive producer of the ABC series Abbott Elementary. She has received six Emmy nominations and won the 2022 Emmy for Outstanding Writing for a Comedy Series, as well as the 2023 Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series. Mike is a producer, writer, director, and actor. He created the critically acclaimed NBC comedy, The Good Place, and co-created Parks and Recreation, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and Rutherford Falls. He's an executive producer on HBO Max's Hacks, and Netflix's Master of None. Schur spent four years as a writer-producer on NBC's The Office. His first writing job was on Saturday Night Live. We're thrilled to bring you today's conversation in collaboration with the Sundance Institute, NBC Universal, Variety, Writers Guild of America East, Writers Guild of America West, and Yeah Impact. Welcome Quinta and Mike. We're so thrilled to have you here today. Thank you. To Meredith Hi. Milton and uh, to the NRDC for having us here. I'm very excited to be in conversation with the great Quinta Brunson. Hello, Quinta. How are you? Hi, Mike. I am beyond elated to be in conversation with you for such a good cause. It's very rare you get to meet people who are your heroes and then they're actually nice, but then you get to meet them for a really, really great cause. So this is cool. This is very cool. Uh, you and I have met maybe once very briefly before at a, um, oh, yeah, at a good place rap party. At a good place rap party. That's right. You were uh, a guest of uh, was NBC a, employee who, was, was, who works on this exact cause. Who works on this exact cause. My friend Kimberly Burnick, who works on keeping things green. I say she's part of the green team. She doesn't like that. But to me, that's what she's part of. I don't think that's the official name. She's a part of the sustainability team at NBC Universal. The green team's better. Let's just call it that. Why are we, That's what I call we... it. <laughs> uh, but I, I didn't forget. I thought you forgot. So. Oh, no, not at all. And it, it, it was a long time ago, and a whole lot has happened since then, um, mm -hmm. both in the world and also in the world of, of climate and climate justice and all of the sorts of things we're here to talk about. I, yeah. I think this is what I would uh, like to ask you, first of all, as a creator and writer and actor and all of the other things you are. To me... The subject that we're actually talking about mainly here, I think, is how in the world do you take the most important subject facing the universe that we live in and incorporate it into what you and I both do, which is write half hour comedy shows. Just and, yeah. and that, I think, is a thing that everyone who has our job or anything remotely approaching our job is struggling with. And yeah. so I, I guess I would just ask you straight up, like, what is your approach to this? How have you thought about it? How have you done it on your show? Yeah. Um, this to me is the most universal issue. I think that if the planet doesn't survive, that kind of affects everyone. Seems like it. Depends on, you yeah. know, who you ask. But I think that, yeah, if it doesn't survive, you know, we're, we're all in trouble. So I find it to be the easiest thing to implement. Um, I remember when I was writing the pilot of, of Abbott, it felt good to talk about climate change. And granted, I didn't want to hit people over the head with it. And Abbott is arguably about another political issue. Mm -hmm. But I was approaching it from the comedic standpoint. And I I like to approach things 
finding the most universal thread for everyone first. It is universal and anything that's universal means, okay, if you're a writer, it's a thing you can talk about. It's easy It's easy to, to think about talking about it. What's yeah. less easy is actually talking about it because the, the problem, especially in comedy, I think, is that no one likes being lectured to, right? Like yeah. no one wants to feel like they're doing homework. When I was working on The Good Place, um, I and I was pitching the show to NBC, I had this conversation with them where I was like, look, this is about moral philosophy and it's about ethics, but I promise I won't make it feel like homework. Mm -hmm. And and then like in the third episode of the show, Chidi, the character Chidi was standing at a blackboard and it said philosophy 101 on the blackboard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh well, but but um, that was the the thing we wrestled with all the time on that show it was like whatever issue we were talking about, philosophical, ethical, or otherwise. I was like, the, God, we have to have jokes. This has to be entertaining. Yeah. Like you, you've made a deal with the audience that they're going to tune in at a certain time or click a button on a streamer, and what they're going to get is like thirty minutes of happiness. At happiness, some level. yeah, right. And so while I agree that like there's no shortage of um ideas for how to talk about climate or or even like the, there's no uh there's no lack of uh, impetus to talk about it or desire to talk about it especially with younger writers i find yeah it's still not it's not it's not easy to just seamlessly weave something this enormous and calamitous into the discrete chunks of comedy that you're trying to make and and use to relate to your audience that's the trick to me right i think that's the trick with abbott a lot of our climate jokes come from Ava, a character that you think mm -hmm. would not be worried about the climate, but actually has a base level understanding that calamities are happening around us. And she talks about them as they pertain to her day. Do you know what I mean? And I think right. that's what's interesting about climate change while catastrophic is that it is affecting everyone. And I know you know this because I'm rewatching The Good Place currently. It wasn't in preparation for this conversation. I just <laughs> wanted to rewatch. But um, you know, you guys dropped some pretty heavy jokes. You know about the yeah. state of the world and where we are. Yeah, well, one of the themes of that show was um like when you're thinking about like what does it mean to be like a good person on earth? Um there are enormous problems and yeah. then there are very small everyday problems yeah and the the temptation i think and the the risk if you're interested in just being a good person or trying to do good is that the big problems are so big that it starts to seem pointless to take care of the little problems right, right. when the earth is melting and so what we were trying to say on that show was like you you do good in the ways that you can do good in the things that you can control yeah and so we were we were trying to make jokes and trying to make points on that show that were along the lines of like, no, not no one of us can change this. This is not a thing that one person can solve. It's a thing that we all have to agree is worth solving and necessary to solve. And then we all have to do all of these things. It's just this tricky thing where you're trying, you're tricky. saying like, you're you're both saying this is the biggest problem that we face as human beings on earth. And also no one of us can really solve it by themselves. We right. all, it's something we all have to do together. That's a really messy, blurry, muddy world that we have to live in, you know? It is. And by writing the shows that you've written and the show that I've written, the one, um, I think I'm, I'm just such a fan of your work because I do think you've ventured to make people understand that, yes, you have your life, right? You have your people, your unit, your family, your coworkers, whatever it is. You have impact on each other through your actions, but you do have impact on the world, right? And it's it doesn't have to be the theme of the show. It doesn't have to be the main point, but in Abbott, the fact that my characters even talk about climate change in their own way. Um, in an episode, we have Ava say, why is it February and hotter than the devil's booty hole? And that, to me, that was my biggest, I was like, man, I got to joke about <laughs> the state of climate change in there for me and from her and for people who are watching the show. 
to think, yeah, why is it February in this hot? And to me, that awareness is important, not only for the characters in my world, but for the audience watching at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, yeah. I, th this is like, this is something I've thought about a lot. I, did you see the movie? Don't look up the yeah, uh, I saw that movie. movie. Okay. So yeah. the, I, I, I like that movie a, a great deal. And I was very yeah. grateful that it got made. And I was mm -hmm. very grateful to all of the folks who made it. I remember being sad when, when a lot of people kind of had an adverse reaction to it because I didn't think climate change. I'm like, it's climate change, dude. You make anything about it. Sign up. Yeah. Right. With with Meryl Streep and Jennifer Lawrence. And we yeah. like it was just like I wait, had some wait. writer friends who were like, well, the analogy isn't perfect because climate change is largely, you know, human generated and an asteroid is more of a sort of black swan freak event or whatever. And I was like, All right, yeah, sure. Okay, Fine. girl. Yes, it's not yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i i mean right. i think adam i'm adam mckay was a head writer of snl when i was there yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and is like a comedy hero of mine yeah. i i have oftentimes when people say to me who's the funniest person you've ever met if i have to answer the answer is very often adam mckay i don't think That's there's really anyone cool. I, who's ever been who's ever made me laugh the way that he's made me laugh and so just for him to cash in his chips mm -hmm. he's he's accrued yeah. a significant amount of political capital yeah and of actual capital by making the most the funniest most entertaining movies in the world and just to get to this point in his life where he's like well this is what matters and so this is what i'm doing i think he w regardless of what you think of the movie i think he deserves an enormous amount of credit for making that yeah. choice and i think everyone involved mm -hmm. in that movie deserves that credit too there is one thing that i wish had been in that movie and the thing I wish had been in that movie was when the when the asteroid is coming, mm -hmm. everybody knows that the asteroid is coming and and Leonardo DiCaprio mm -hmm. and Jennifer Lawrence are rushing around mm -hmm. trying to make people understand what's going to happen. I, I wanted there to be a character somewhere who they said to this character, like, don't you understand? Like, this thing is coming and whatever. And I wanted someone to go, and what? And what am I supposed to do about it? How yeah. can I, like, I have... My mom is sick. Right. I got to get my kids to school. Right. And I'm, I'm you know, my brother in law is going through a divorce. And like, right. I, I know it's happening. I just don't know what it is that I'm supposed to do. And I think, yeah. look, there's there's some part of the population of this country and any country who mm. ha suffers from uh, some kind of uh, brain worm disease or has been misled by. Um, media outlets who shall remain nameless who are yeah. like that's all fake right there's, yeah yeah, yeah. You, we've lost some portion of people who are like that's fake that's not real right there's another group of people who are like i understand that there's climate change i just i just don't, don't know what to do about it i don't know what to do i yeah. and, and and i suspect i can't do anything yeah and i think when we're talking about working climate mm -hmm. issues into fictional stories i right. think those are the sorts of people that we're really trying to reach like yeah we're not trying to reach people who are like i know this is a really big deal and i read those articles in the yeah yeah I'm and not... whatever like we're, we're it's trying to... are, they're on it those people are on it right they're on it and they're they know it. they know the degree to which it's a, a crisis and they understand that they need to be advocates and 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 activists for the right sorts of politicians and everything else right we're we're really trying to get at the folks who who th who believe that it's real and understand that it's real but just are feeling a little bit lost or untethered or unsure of how to proceed that's where i think specifically comedy can really help because i think comedy mm -hmm. is a is a great delivery mechanism for tough ideas i think if, i agree sometimes if it's a drama and and people feel like people are lecturing or bellowing or wagging their fingers it starts to be like ah, uh, leave me alone right but comedy if you can make if you can say it's hotter than the devil's booty hole <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> or uh, just make people it sort of normalize yeah the issue that we're talking about i think that is the best way to approach those folks you know you just said so many things i had so many thoughts but one main thought is comedy more than I think any other medium. It's the reason why people call the shows you have made and the shows you've been part of and the show that I've made their comfort shows because comedies get to be a friend in someone's home. So it's mm -hmm. not someone wagging their finger at you or someone who's 
more intelligent than you telling you what you need to do. It's your friend actually having a conversation with you who loves you, cares about you, comes into your home every night. That's a very comfortable, friendly conversation. So that to me makes it a better engine to talk about any social issue. But climate yeah. climate change, especially, you know, I, I have to be honest and I don't know if it's, which I'd love to talk about in this, if it's because of my generation Climate change is at the forefront of everything I think about. Whether the story will be about it or not is different, but it's a part of the language of any story I want to tell because to me, it is at the front of my brain when I think about what's happening and how the world needs to change immediately. We both agree, I would say, that of the 7,000 really important things facing us here in America in 2024. Number one, above all of them, is climate change. It just mm -hmm. is. It, because, like you said, it doesn't matter who wins the 2024 presidential election if the planet dies, right? Like, it's all, everything else, it just, it, it blots out the sun. Yeah. No no visual pun intended. about <laughs> for, for all, yeah, for all their other issues. So, OK, so given that, so you said, and I feel the same way, that on a day to day basis, whether it's in my own life or creatively, mm -hmm. climate change is always it's floating. It's in front of me. It's always right yeah. here. I'm thinking mm -hmm. I think about it all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I I think it's there's nothing that we face that's more important, all that sort of stuff. The right. question is, how do you so you're writing a show, you create a show and you're writing a show and you're starting the show that also makes incredibly deft, delicate, and trenchant points about the public school system in America. Another very important issue. It's one mm -hmm. of it's toward the top of the 7,000 things mm -hmm. that we face. Yeah. And so the, so how do you modulate like how in knowing that you think that climate change is the most important thing, your show is about another very important thing. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do we toggle back and forth between whatever we are talking about episode to episode or show to show or whatever and also keep this thing that's the most important thing in the background or the foreground at all times. That's a that's another trick we're trying to pull off here. I start with comedy first and relationships first, interesting characters in their relationships, and then I can get there. The thing that was cool to me about Abbott, I've said this before, was not the political or, so, or social issue of public schools. What was most interesting to me was this group of people. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it starts with people, a group of people, and you you kind of go from there. And I feel that way, you know, before Abbott became deemed socially conscious, we were just approaching it as a workplace comedy. Right. Because, because of the setting and not shying away from our better person barometer, you know, my co-showrunners who are really good people. We chose not to turn that part off in us. We chose to embrace that. I care about teachers. I care about good people. I care about good schools. Justin and Pat, my co-producers are the, are the same way. So we didn't shy away from those parts that made us feel better, that made us want to talk about being better people and making our characters want to be better. And I think I have the same approach when it comes to climate because in storytelling for Abbott, you know, it's not like it's at the forefront, but then when I have a room of good writers who agree that, hey, if we're starting off talking about the school year and it's, sep it, it's, and it's September and it's blazing hot and there's no air conditioning in the school, naturally that's going to create a conversation about the climate. And I think we're always moving off hope. We we want to create a good comedy. We hope it makes somebody think some more. We don't even want to start a dialogue. We just hope <laughs> it makes some somebody think or do some research. And I feel like that's our small part we can do. And I have the same question for you, especially because you've made so many shows. And before that, you were a part of you know, just thinking about you being on The Office, I feel like this country, at least, wasn't as gun ho about climate change then as it yeah. is now. So I'm so curious about your journey 
and caring about the climate as it pertains to the projects you've been a part of? Well, it, uh, it's I would say one of the best developments in the time I've been doing this is that I think if you tried to talk about climate in 2004 when I started writing for the office, it would have been like, gah, 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 gah. No, 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 no. Nobody, nobody, nobody wants this. People just want it. Was it, like it, the last twenty years are, are night and day in terms of what is permissible mm -hmm. in comedy network or otherwise. Also, right. who gets to tell the stories has yeah. gone is night and day from then to now. So I, so when I started writing, I, it wasn't a question of like how do you work climate into your shows. The answer was you didn't, and if you tried to, people would tell you not to. And now. I, it's not quite the opposite, but I think mm -hmm. I think the world has um, become much more permit. At first, it became more permissive of talking about issues like climate change, right. and then folks started to actually kind of demand it a little yeah. bit. So you know, on the the office was a corporate satire, obviously, right. and we were much more focused on on getting right the the peccadillos and curiosities related to cubicle life and, yeah. and corporate life. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, even if you did that show now, mm -hmm. you would, which obviously you're doing a workplace comedy, obviously a very different environment. But I think even if you were doing a corporate satire show now, their climate would be worked in somehow. The company, like in 30 Rock, there was like, which was a, just a tiny bit after us, like the green right. initiatives, the corporations right. run and the kind of like, the lip service that some of them pay towards like, we're going to be climate neutral by 2045 or whatever. Right. And then you do a little bit of digging and it's like, yeah, they're not really, they're not really, not really. Re <laughs> yeah. So I, I think I, I think my personal like career as a writer has spanned the first, the era of like, shh, mm -hmm. and now the era of like, no, let's go. Let's talk yeah. about it. Cause, cause people care about it more now, which I think is great, obviously. Yeah. I think that um, the really cool part is, you know, I'm just bringing up the good place because it's cool how you get to talk about it in that show in a different way than we get to approach it in Abbott. And um, because climate is a different conversation from community to community. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I find most fascinating about it, right? There's a difference in how my mom talks about it and how my friend who writes for the New York Times talks about it. Mm -hmm. But no matter what, it is affecting us all. There is this nucleus of, even if you're opposed to it, even if you don't believe in it, you're still connected to the, the ball. You're yeah. still in the Venn diagram of how you feel about climate change because there's an approach that way from, I don't think it exists. You're still tied up in this jiggy jungle with the rest of us and the fact that it's a thing that we have to deal with as an yeah. entire planet. It's the only thing, racism, classism, sexism, socialism, we, it's the only thing that we all have to deal with. My question to you, Mike, is how do you use laughter to, you know, approach this subject in particular that otherwise might be very divisive. I I do think that um nothing takes the takes the temperature down on a subject more than comedy. If yeah. uh, if you are if you're being because comedy again is about relating to people, it's about people identifying with with a real person or I oh that person is just like my uncle or that person mm -hmm. is just like my husband or wife or whatever. So I I don't know of a better way. And I and I think yeah. the 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 goal here for folks like you and me who care about this issue and and want to talk about it is to remember like like as as desperate and as um dire as we feel the situation is, the way to get people to come around to our uh, uh way of thinking, or at least to make people understand what we feel is to entertain them and to say like we're all in this together this is not we're not mm -hmm. yelling at you we are we're relating to you we're asking you to like come on this journey with us and yep. we're all gonna fumble around and do the best we can in terms of you know approaching all these huge problems yeah and adding to what you said laughter just immediately brings the the wall down mm -hmm. it's the, the easiest 
your guard is down. You've laughed. We are family. We're in community together. I'm not here to hurt you. Let's have a good time and let's yeah. talk about some things. Yeah, I'm not here to hurt you is like the key is a sort of the key thing to me. Absolutely. It's like I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not here to to, to berate you. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to make you feel bad about yourself. I'm not like mm -hmm. uh no matter how much we all care about this issue or any issue, none of us is perfect. None of us is again getting an A plus on this exam. It's not an exam you can ace. Yeah. And so I promise you, I don't my goal is not to say like I'm doing great and you're doing bad and you need to come up to my level. It's just like yeah. let's just all realize that we're in this boat together and it's leaking and we gotta work together yeah. to plug up the leak. You know, I really feel feel like you just said a key thing, which is this is not an exam to ace and if you were getting an F before and you're getting a D now, that's really cool. That yeah. is important and fantastic. Matters. It's yeah. fantastic. And yeah. good for you, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it's a very hard exam. It's like, a really talking, hard exam. We're talking about a thing where every when you when you start going down into the investigation the like road of the of climate change, you're like, oh, Every single thing that you do affects us. Everything, yeah, every everything single you buy, thing. The thing we're doing right now. The, the thing we're doing we're right now. Right there's now. there's four lights on in my office and we're I using know. electricity. And they're, they're like and and so you it can be overwhelming and it yeah. can also very quickly make you feel like uh, have like a sort of existential crisis of like, well, what's the point of anything we're doing? Mm -hmm. And that that's the darkness we're trying to step around, right? That's the Absolutely. that's the that's the black hole we're trying to keep people out of is feeling yeah. like there's no point. Right. And laughter is a very good method to use to try to avoid that. Absolutely. I think that comedy allows a space where people don't think they have to be perfect because our characters aren't perfect. Mm -hmm. Our characters can say something and then immediately go against it, but it's friendly. They're not villains. Maybe they are villains for the sake of the episode, but you know you'll be friends with them again very soon. Right. And that's a huge part of this discussion. You know, I've done things despite <laughs> thinking I have intense knowledge of this issue. I've made mistakes, you know, and been like, how did I not know that? I can't. <laughs> let a mistake make me feel that it's not important to try. And I feel like comedies allow that space for people. It's still important to try. You probably will fail because that's what trying is all about. Right. But it's important to still attempt it. And, you know, just in me rewatching currently, like I said, I'm rewatching The Good Place now. And, and I think you guys did such a good job of slowly making a lot of people want to be good people. Be <laughs> Thank people. you. <laughs> I, I hope you're right. And that's such a good point that you made, which is that comedy is like a celebration of people's flaws. That's how I've always thought of it. It's like yeah. there's no comedy without a, like flaws and Achilles heels and blind and spots and failure and yeah. like the journey. If you're lucky enough, as we've both been to work on shows that last for a long time, the singular thing to me that TV has as a medium, as an advantage over other media like yeah. movies or whatever, is that you get to incrementally show a human being growing over many years, which yeah. is how that's so, how we experience relationships in real yeah. time, whether it's a with a sibling or a spouse or whatever. Like we live with people every day for years and years and years and years, and we see them grow and change. I've got kids. My son is 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 15. He's a, such a different human being from who he was last year and the year before that. Yeah. And that's what TV gives you. Yep. If you get it, if you, if it lasts for a while is you get to yeah. really just, just build this really intricate staircase and watch the character grow. Mm -hmm. And, and while they're on the staircase, they're slipping and falling and, and, you know, twisting their ankle yeah. every so often. But that's, it's such a good uh, point that you made to say like, that's partially why I think comedy is a good way to talk about stuff like this because yeah. if you feel like you are being lectured to by some godlike figure who knows all and sees all you just are like well i can't live up to that standard i can't like i'm not perfect i'm a flawed person i make mistakes i'm selfish i'm i i you know i'm constantly stepping in it with my friends and i there's no way i could ever achieve that but if you can identify 
with a comedy character and watch that comedy character screw up and fall mm -hmm. down and whatever. And that comedy character has this sense of like, I really care about this thing. Yeah. And you will care about that thing because it's just closer to your experience of life or something. Yeah. You know? With comedy, you can, you can point out the way something is as a joke. And what I mean by that is, you know, to me, one of my favorite episodes of 30 Rock in recent time is this episode where they have a, they're doing the green week. And <laughs> at a point, Liz Lemon says, "Where they, what is NBC going to do? Just put the green peacock in the corner? And then the green peacock <laughs> appears and then goes away. And it's like, yeah. to me, that is the simplest form of word I sometimes don't like to use, but activism within comedy, because while they're on the air and while they're on the network that does the thing, they get to point out how how bad it is and how absurd it is that this is our <laughs> way of fighting these things. And yeah. you can't do that anywhere but a comedy. Right. A small, making a small difference in a good way is so much better than making a small difference in a bad way. <laughs> like if you can help to not be on the other side. That's so that true. Pendulum, it's so true. You never want yeah. to feel that you added in a small way to something horrible. When we're talking about Hollywood and climate change, there's, there's sort of two levels. There's the stories that we tell. And then there's also the actual productions that we need to make those stories happen. And those productions, as we said before, involve an enormous number of people uh, a lot of energy and fuel and everything else. And part of the, the, you know, the small way that we can make a tangible difference while we're making these shows is just by the choices that we make uh, in terms of writing the scripts and actually producing the material. And I know mm -hmm. this is a thing that you, you have talked before about like yeah. the kind of choices that you try to make on Abbott in order to reduce the amount of like effect you're having on the environment. Yes. So this is interesting because this starts with you from multiple shows you've worked on. I've always been inspired by mockumentary, right? Just thought it was great. Mm -hmm. It was just in a format that really inspired me. So when I started Abbott, I had no idea how much, because I can't take the utmost responsibility for being artistically inspired for those by those kinds of comedies. But all of a sudden I found myself in this world where we shoot on a Warner Brothers lot, which once again, in making this workplace comedy that lives on stages, not on location, I didn't know that inadvertently, we'd be creating a world where, okay, we're not using energy and fuel on location and traveling our trailers. We don't even have trailers. All we have is a hair and makeup trailer. We're in dressing rooms. We're not using full fuel. The lights cut off automatically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same thing on the stages. We're never moving or using a bunch, <laughs> using a bunch of shit. Another weird, cool thing is like on our show, and I'm not saying everyone get a bunch of kids and throw them on your show, but kids pumpkin out. You got to get done in a good amount of time. Yeah. Pumpkining out means that they're, they, they wrap at a certain time and that's it. You cannot bring those kids back. They're children. You are not allowed to work them past a certain hour. That right. automatically, all of these things inadvertently made us more sustainable. We're right. losing we're using less energy. Our carbon footprint is significantly lower than other shows that have less episodes. Um and I think that's really cool. So that's I, great. I don't know. Yeah. And I never and I never knew that would be the case. I just want to say how being inspired by some art that came before me inspired me to do something that automatically made our production more sustainable. And I think that's the beauty of setting a new norm. I don't know if you guys knew you were doing that when you started working on so your documentaries. I don't think it was intentional. I mean, on The Office, we never left. We yeah. never left. Uh, yeah. We were almost, because uh, it was really about the kind of claustrophobia of the corporate cubicle zoo yeah. environment, right? Mm -hmm. But when we started Parks and Rec, we kind of, we backed into this because mm -hmm. we uh, were always almost getting canceled. <laughs> and so we had to we had to be super cautious with budget and stuff. And and right. we moved really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And we had this thing where like, OK, if we needed to be uh, at a restaurant because Parks and Rec was out more than 
the office. But if we needed to be in a restaurant, we would say like, let's just pick one that's like around the corner right? and we won't load up the trucks and drive right. them all the way across the down the 170 to some weird place. Right. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It looks like a restaurant. Fine. And so we started doing this thing that we literally called light footprint. We mm-hmm. would be like, okay, let's make this a light footprint outing. And it was like, mm-hmm. let's bring the fewest number of people in the fewest number of vehicles for the mm-hmm. shortest amount of time. Mm-hmm. And it, and it, uh, I, I'm not claiming that this was about the environment. It was about budget and it was about like moving quickly. Yeah. But after a while, it started to occur to me like, oh, we are saving an enormous amount of money and fuel. Mm-hmm. Those two things. We are not. Yeah. The, and the cast on that show was very tight. And so ordinarily you would say like, okay, if we're going on location, we need seven trailers for these seven people. Right. But we would say to them, could you guys do us a favor and mm-hmm. just, we'll just have one trailer and it'll, and it'll just be where you can hang out between setups. And because they liked each other they were, they were all friends, they'd be like, absolutely. They prefer that anyway. And if we yeah. had seven trailers, they probably all would have gone to Amy Polo's trailer and hung out right. anyway. So yeah. we actually backed into it and began to realize just from a cost standpoint, how much money we're not paying for that gas to run on those seven right. trailers for 12 hours a day. Right. And that meant we're not pumping smoke into the air. And it yeah. it started to become a thing that I was like, well, if we can do it on this show, we can do it on any show. Let's try to replicate this wherever we go. Yeah. And to the extent that we can, we've we've continued to do that on other shows. I really love the work NBC Universal does to make sure that their sets are being the best that they possibly can be. Because yeah. I think for Hollywood, it was a vast shift. I remember speaking with the, um, at another climate panel, the um, guys who did everything everywhere all at once, the Daniels. And that was something they implemented into their production, just making sure that they use as little fuel as possible, making sure that the sets and, um, you know, every when they use different sets, it was like, how can we make sure when they do have to go on location? Because that's a movie. It's different. Right, right. They were like, how can we use as little energy as possible? And they were even worried about things that I now think about, which is environmental harm with lights mm-hmm. and sound, which has now become a concern. Of mine. Yeah. Are you killing a bunch of bugs with the light and smoke that you're putting into an environment when you go there? Yeah. Um, so now that's something I think about. And, that, and, and, and I just have to go back to how these are all puzzle pieces of people trying their best that lead to a better world. I didn't know that was your experience on that show. And now I know that that's something that we can implement. I'm going to now ask my cast when we do go on location, are you guys comfortable sharing a trailer? We will see how that goes. We all love (laughs) each other very, we all love each other very much, but we will see how that goes. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I mean, look again, we're talking about degrees, right? It's like, if you used to use seven trailers when you went on location and the next time you go out, you use three, that's, significantly better that's yeah. fewer that's 42 percent as many than you were using before like that's good like that's yeah. what we're talking about really when we get down to it yeah when you drill down it's like are you that was the message of the good place are you doing a better job today than you were yesterday that's all Absolutely. that anyone can ask of anyone else you know yeah that thing you just said though was so smart about like it so much of this is about resetting standards and practices and just normalizing the kind of world that you hope continues right if we just could create a different norm slowly but surely and not expect each other to be perfect while creating that norm because that is a key part i just don't think we have the infrastructure to be perfect right now this is a good um segue into something that i think is cool is that you driving a segue is that what's just happening um let's talk about ways that other people out there who are telling stories and creating work what are some ways that both you and I think they can implement climate change into their stories or behind the scenes well I I would say a couple things about that one would be that uh don't do it cynically right like don't don't do it because it's a topic du jour or it feels like if you integrate climate into your story, you're capturing a zeitgeisty subject or something like right. that will read as cynical very quickly to right. folks, both who might buy your thing and also audiences if it gets made. 
So do it if you feel it. Do it if yeah. it, do it if it's a thing that matters to you and that it's a subject that you think you want to talk about and is germane to whatever the project you're working on is. I love when that, people use germane. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that that's the most important thing. And then the second thing is again, you know, I assume that we're talking about comedy and non-comedy oriented folks and uh, I would only say that um, whether you're writing a comedy or a drama, that you what you want to avoid is the thing that you and I've been talking about for the last hour, which is basically I don't it's a scary subject it, uh, and and it's a divisive subject to some degree. And I think that what you want to avoid is folks feeling like you're wagging your finger at them. If you're yep. if if the characters are doing this and they're getting on their high horse and they're lecturing you and they're they're saying like you're a fool because you don't do x y and z or whatever i think you're the people who agreed with you will still agree with you and you will also lose all of the people who are in yep. that middle it's it's yep. not fundamentally different i think from from uh, doing like a, a political campaign like yep there's a certain part of the country is going to vote one way, a certain part's going to vote the other way. And every four years, every two years, the battle is for the folks in the middle. Yep. And to whatever extent you can, you want to try to, to get those folks to buy into what you're talking about. And, and I think this, this stuff is the stuff that loses people. Absolutely. I guess my answer would be, it was similar. The kind of approach with this stuff for me is friend, not foe. Like if you're a foe, if you're coming at people, like you you're mad at them and you want to hurt them but i think you're a friend if you're like i'd like to have a conversation with you about this friend the way you want to have a conversation with your friend about their really horrible boyfriend is like dude you need to break up you know like i love you in fact i think he's great too but i think this isn't a good relationship that's having a conversation with your friend instead of being like right. you need to dump him he's horrible you're horrible that's not how people really respond well they want and to also and also if you do that you know that your friend's going to get back together with that guy and then you'll have to like take it all back. And You don't want right. the audience to get back with harming the environment. You want them to try to do better. <laughs> and um, I think another thing I would say is to not avoid it. And that's with climate change and other projects. I think if you are writing and your pen naturally goes towards a joke or a storyline that brings up climate change, don't avoid it. I think that means you're the person that should be telling that story like don't right. become afraid of it you know don't do it because it is zeitgeisty or important do it because that's where your pen is naturally flowing that's that's what you care about you that's know? a good way to put it yeah. yeah and 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 i would say that that it i think that a huge part of this future for us um out there is the normalization of the discussion of this stuff yep. and of and, and the way that you normalize it is it's just part of our discussions it's part yep. of our daily lives and it doesn't matter whether it's a rom-com or like a, a you know a, a weird swedish murder show or something like if it's all it affects all of us it, it's always around and so the more that it's just sort of a part of the landscape of our entertainment i think the more comfortable people get with talking about it Absolutely. Yep. Connection to this to community and the larger community, which is actually the entire planet. That's right. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Quinta and Mike. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. This was incredible and a dream of mine. Oh, that's so kind of you. This was a true pleasure. Uh, it's great to talk to you. Thank you to everyone who put this together. And yeah, good yeah. luck, everyone, on everything that you write, uh, write and work on. Thanks to the Sundance Film Festival for hosting us today. And thank you to all of you for joining us. If you are a writer, please consider submitting your script to the NRDC Climate Storytelling Fellowship, sponsored in partnership with The Blacklist, the Redford Center, and CAA Foundation. Our program grants $20,000 to three fellows to support revision of their feature or pilot script that reflects the climate crisis in a compelling and thoughtful way. The NRDC Climate Storytelling Fellowship will announce this year's fellows and creative mentors soon, and the next cycle of the program will open for submissions this spring. We encourage you to visit the website to learn more. So I'd like to thank you one last time for joining us today and thank our incredible partners, the Sundance Institute, NBC Universal, Variety, 
Writers Guild of America East, Writers Guild of America West, and Ya yeah, Impact. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your Sundance. here with Julia Roberts at the Cannes Film Festival. The Variety Lounge here at the Sarajevo Film Festival. We're here at the Carlo Vivari Film Festival where we're receiving the Crystal Globe. And I remember feeling equal parts fear of getting a part and not getting the part. Now this is the time for action. To be in a theater with strangers and laughing and crying and gasping and having those moments together is part of the reason I fell in love with this industry. It's like breathing again.